What does we mean? The Oxford English Dictionary defines it as being used by a speaker to refer to himself or herself and one or more other people considered together. How then do we determine who the people considered together are? One way is common interest. We are a group interested in going to watch a game, for example. Another might be accidental or geographical association. We are a community or a family. Since the progenitor of the European Union, the European Economic Community, was given birth to in 1957, federalists and unionists have been concerned with the question of a European we that can challenge the we of the national identity. Whether you're a supporter or a detractor of the European Union, the question of how identity functions at the national and international level is a notoriously difficult phenomenon to study and understand. While simultaneously being an important foundation of political action, many have thought that the construction of a European we is fundamental to the success or failure of the European project in whichever form you want it to take. Being a supranational government, the European Union supersedes part of national sovereignty, giving Brussels the right and means to make laws on regulation, migration, trade and human rights. If this power is not thought of as legitimate, it is sure to collapse. Brexit was a referendum over this legitimacy. National events, sports, wars, national holidays, royal weddings, newspapers, mailboxes, all of these have a symbolic function that subtly but powerfully enforce our sense of citizenship. People are always being reminded of the we as a psychological anchor. Exactly what constitutes that anchor and its exact function is much more difficult to understand. To what extent do our values have to be shared? Values about democratic procedure, welfare or human rights, for example. How much of our history has to be shared? Our conceptions of art, culture and science? What about language? It seems fundamental, but many countries are multilingual. Switzerland, for example, has four official languages. How about geography, mobility, accessibility? One thing that seems plausible is that the more these factors converge, the more a sense of shared identity is possible. Many have noted, for example, that these limits have been transcended by modern technology, making the old rules about national identity redundant. On top of that, transnational companies are more common, and our modern society demands similar skills from everyone – basic literacy, maths and computer skills. Europe, although difficult to define, has many of these shared values. Some would say that the European project has been relatively successful because of this. There is also a sense of a shared past in Christianity, the Roman Empire and the Renaissance, for example. Shared memories about the past lead to common symbolic points of conversation that can lead on to further discussion. Again, it's not about the content of the past so much as the fact that it's a common frame of reference. In other words, the possibilities have to be at least tangentially similar for there to be a shared future. And there are increasingly common futures as well. Global shifts in power, global warming, global migration, to name a few. And while being European might mean different things to different people, this isn't necessarily the point. Being British or French means different things to each person. Again, the point is not so much the content, the signified, but the strength of the actual signifier as being an effective we. So Europe as a collective identity has some of these things, but there are also many things missing. Who picks up a European newspaper, watches European evening news or a European soap opera? This is where politics and psychology collide. We don't know how important these subtle psychological symbolisms are for underpinning the structure of our societies. From the European Union itself, there have been concrete attempts by the Eurocrats to nurture and develop this sense of shared identity. The European flag was raised for the first time in May 1986. The European anthem, Ode to Joy, has been used since 1972. 
Two years after that, the EU road signs replaced custom signs at border crossings. Driving licences also became relatively uniform across the EU in 1986. In 1985, the EU sponsored the European Yacht Race, and in 1986, the Tour of Future Cycling Race. And who remembers that glorious moment on the 10th of June 1986, when a prize was awarded to a Danish girl in Copenhagen for receiving the 250,000th EU passport. No, me neither. So a lot of these attempts to construct an identity seem pretty lacklustre, to say the least, and laughable to say the most, and I think pretty unimaginative. But the defenders of this strategy might say that the actual events aren't the point. The point is to kickstart a conversation, start a spark, remind people that it's on the table, so that the process of identity formation might happen more naturally. Of course, I think intuitively, most people would see the attempts at building a European identity as being mostly so far unsuccessful. But actually, despite what seems like the dominance of negative press about the EU and its institutions, Across all of Europe, until recently, the famous Eurobarometer polling shows increasing levels of support for the EU year on year. But some might question the possibility of multiple we's. As I looked at in my last video on Hegel and Tony Soprano, the question of split identity is an important one. But as sociologist Anthony Smith writes, there is plenty of historical evidence for the coexistence of concentric circles of allegiance. In the ancient world, it was possible to be Athenian, Ionian and Greek all at the same time. In the medieval world, to be Bernese, Swiss and Protestant. In the modern third world, to be Igbo, Nigerian and African simultaneously. Similarly, one could feel simultaneously Catalan, Spanish and European. Even dare one say it, Scottish or English, British and European. What's interesting about the EU is being able to watch an identity being attempted to be created in such a short time frame. National identities develop over centuries. And one of the perennial questions in theory is whether they are developed primarily by elites through newspapers, governments, education, from the top down, or whether they develop from below as a functional need for people. Recent studies on the European Union might start to shine some new light on these questions. Whatever happens, at the very least, we might gain some new insights into questions of identity. One of the things closest to us, yet one of the things least understood. If you want to support Then and Now, then there's a few ways you can help. You can, of course, subscribe, like and share below. And importantly, click that bell to be notified of new videos. You can also support me on Patreon, where you'll get access to scripts and audio early. I answer questions and can put your name in the credits for as little as a dollar per month, thanks to my existing Patreon supporters. Also, if you're thinking of buying something on this topic, if you do so through my Amazon link below in the description, I'll receive a small commission at no extra cost to you, all of which helps the channel out massively. Thanks for watching and see you next week.